Maar ik denk dat we wel kunnen beginnen. Goed zo. Uh, nog even voor de mensen die net zijn aangesloten, de lezing wordt opgenomen um, en op YouTube geplaatst. Dus uh, ja, als mensen daar uh, problemen mee hebben, moeten ze dat even aangeven. Uh, maar ja, dan weet je dat in ieder geval. Uh, nou, ten eerste welkom allemaal. Fijn dat jullie er zijn. Uh, vandaag zetten we weer een ontzettend interessante lezing in de planning. Uh, zoals aangegeven zal deze in het Engels zijn. Uh, hetzelfde wil ik ook even overschakelen. Today's lecture will be given by Jean T, who is joining us all the way from Canada. First off, I am uh, very thankful he is here to talk to us about the environmental change in boreal and subarctic ecosystems and the use of satellite images to uh, imaging to read the landscape. Uh, Jean T has an incredible uh, incredibly impressive career, uh, holding a master's degree in landscape ecology. He has worked among many things on initiating and developing geographic information systems to remotely monitor and survey the northern landscapes. Um, he has directed various uh, government departments in both implementing these systems and innovating on uh, new online GIS systems. Uh, during the last decades, uh, Jean T has worked as an international consultant on climate change issues, sustainable forest management and permafrost monitoring. He has worked uh, for the IUCN with regards to Arctic ecosystem management, and he has been elected fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Uh, all this was actually uh, rooted in the Netherlands, being originally from Amsterdam and studying at the Hoge Bosbouwschool in Park Sonsbeek, Arnhem, uh, a forerunner of the Van Hal Larenstein. Um, so before I pass the word to Jean, some uh, formalities. I want to quickly remind everyone to mute themselves and to ask questions in the chat. Uh, I will in turn take a moment to ask Jean, uh, Jean the questions. And also if you have trouble with asking in, in English, uh, it's okay to ask the question in Dutch. Uh, I will translate the question for you. Um, same, same goes if you need a translation for some words, uh, just type in the chat and uh, me or someone else will translate it for you. Um, I am I am absolutely stoked for this lecture uh, since I absolutely love Canada uh, and I'm ready to be taken from our micromanaged little world to a place that is so fast. Most places are only uh, accessible by a bush plane. Um, so Sean, uh, I think we're all set. If you're ready, okay. um, you can uh, Open your Share my screen. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I go to presentation mode. It takes a bit of time. Present a view. And I change my cursor to laser pointer. Wel, uh, voor mij is het natuurlijk wel erg uh, interessant om over Canada te praten. En uh, zoals ik uh, helaas moet doen, uh, although, although Nederlands een belangrijke taal voor mij is en ik het nog dadelijk thuis, thuis spreek, vind ik het nogal moeilijk eigenlijk om in het Engels over mijn werk te praten. Vandaar helaas dat de conversatie zal gaan in het, uh, in het Engels. En, uh, um, I had a fascinating time in Canada uh, since I uh, yeah, left Holland and I want to give you a bit of a perspective of how much 100 years of change in Canada's boreal forest uh, may look like. Uh, the starting image is NASA's blue marble image, uh, a winter image which shows with because of the snow cover very nicely the distribution of trees. In a way it gives you an immediate introduction into to Canada's major landscape ecoregions, and that are the boreal and the subarctic. Um, when you see that appear, and uh, I should say there may be delay typically in the shift of slides because of the uh, um, area I am kind of broadcasting from. But when you look at the boreal, this brown zone on the image, and the kind of light green, um, almost turquoise on the top, we talk about the boreal and the subarctic ecozones of Canada, which represent roughly, uh, you know, about six million square kilometers of land, uh, a major uh, system and quite fascinating. 
Now, you guys have escaped the snow. Uh, I'm still sitting in the middle of this kind of uh, snow landscape, as I said, broadcasting from this log house somewhere in a remote area. Uh, my download speed is 10 megabytes per second. My upload speed is in the order of about 0.5 uh, megabytes per second. This may cause a delay in slides, and therefore there could be a risk of uh, problem with synchronization between what I say sometimes and the slide as they appear. Um, but, you know, uh, I'll, I'll try to and have to slow down a bit in, uh, in the way I talk. Essentially, I want to give you uh, thumbnail sketches, not really detailed scientific perspectives, but thumbnail sketches of the importance of fires. Fires, they are everywhere in the Canadian system. And you cannot really understand boreal systems if you don't really have an appreciation of the significance of fires. And of course, permafrost, where you saw the previous picture with the snow in a country like ours, is very extensive and it comes very far to the south as well. Uh, the real question is nowadays is when did the melting start and I try to give a bit of an answer to that. The other thing that is kind of amazing in the last hundred years is the tremendous change that has taken place with regards to beaver. They were almost extinct around the 1900s. The conservation started around the 1930s and now you will see what has happened. They have taken over the world. There is a bit of a link to climate change in what I will be talking about. And I also hope to kind of give you an idea how impressive some of these satellite images are and how important tools they can be uh, for you as well in um, using them in your work. Um, as you already have seen a bit in uh, the introduction that uh, Gerard uh, heeft gegeven, I, I started with Boswell and Kultuurtechniek in Sonsbeek. And, Voor ons was het altijd een beetje het nijrode voor het landschapsbeheer. Thereafter, I moved when I was already in Canada to the ITC in Delft to study air photo interpretation. And as part of the preparation for the mission of NASA, uh, the mission uh, to Earth of the uh, National Aeronautics and Space uh, uh, Organization, uh, I was sent to, uh, selected by Canada to go to Purdue for uh, a, a short term to get prepared for the, the launch of the satellite. I did my master's at University of Manitoba in landscape ecology, but most of it was really dealing with uh, automated satellite classification, the use of mainframe computers. So in a way, you can see that in a, in, a, in a period of about three years, I moved from the chainsaw to the mainframe computing system, which was quite a, an exciting period, actually. Uh, the other thing, of course, what Gerard also mentioned, in a sense, is the, the sheer magnitude of Canada itself. And uh, I, the, the imprint of the first job I had uh, when I started here after uh, Arnhem was uh, as forester with the Canada Land Inventory Project. And it was not just a simple project, it was a project that covered about two and a half kilometers of Canada's land, a million kilometers of Canada's land, and it was doing a, a, a large um, multidisciplinary resource inventory, mapping, uh, agriculture, forestry, wildlife, recreation, sport, fish, all those different capabilities of the land to improve the planning. And uh, it created 25,000 maps. And not a surprise, it also was the foundation for the creation of the world's first geographic information system, which I was later getting involved with as well. Uh, my role, when you come, of course, from uh, Feld Arnhem, was in the Bosbau, uh, doing a Bodemgeschiktheidsklassificatie for Bosbau, uh, class one to seven. Uh, in itself, of course, not a, a big thing. You do look at soils, you look at climate, you look at succession and forest, and you measure tree growth. Uh, but of course, there you do uh, uh, an area the size of the Netherlands with four guys in um, in one year. So the, the tools that you use and the 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 uh, the, excite, well, the the opportunities it creates, the different dimensions it provides, is rather amazing. Uh, after that time, I spent much of my time really uh, in, for the next 10, 20 years in ecological land surveys in northern Canada. Um, now, if there is one thing that uh, made a difference in my career, which gave me a competitive advantage, you know, I, I call them smart tools and I can call, I can include satellite, GIS, etc. and all those things as well. But perhaps the most important thing is the stereoscope. Uh, the stereoscope maybe may look like an old-fashioned tool to you, but essentially it is like 
working in virtual reality, avant la lettre. It is flying over a landscape with a helicopter. It is zooming in with a drone. It is doing macro and micro relief like you see in LiDAR maps. And to give you an example of the excitement of these micro relief features, I have added there on the image uh, uh, a Dutch selection of the Celtic fields that are in Bellower uh, field there. That are so easily visible because of the micro relief, but normally you would not see them always in the landscape. So essentially, the stereoscope was the first tool that created the magic and that really made my job uh, or created, a, 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 I would say, a competitive and comparative advantage in my work. Now, of course, many of you will start at the start of your career. I'm at the end of my career and I sort of get with no nostalgia back at the field work, uh, flying around with fixed wing float planes, helicopters, camping. Uh, all those things that leave an impression in your life that is there forever. And that amazingly now I can revisit again uh, with satellite and find some rather amazing discoveries as well. Um, I'd like to give you a bit of an impression how it felt when um, um, we started working with satellite. Today we have the NASA Mars mission. The, the Perseverance rover, and it is quite exciting to see these images. Then we had NASA's mission to Earth. It was the first satellite that was launched to uh, to study the Earth, to study its environment, and it changed the way we're looking at landscapes and ecosystems. It, it was a really uh, exciting time for starting landscape ecologists uh, like myself. And uh, um, now, when you look at satellites, they are slightly different, of course, than normal area of photography. They are scanners and they scan the Earth in a, in a, in a digital kind of almost pattern, as you can see. The, you see the scanner on the, on the image on, the, on, on top on the right hand side, the scan pattern of, um, in this case, an Arctic area uh, in the middle and the computer output at the bottom. You can do this, this kind of classification. The Earth Resources Technology satellite at that time was really low resolution, 60 meters. Nowadays, we talk about 15 meters. And actually, we work and I work even with uh, one and half meter resolution at the moment. But so for us, this was and for me in particular, it was a, a, an exciting time. And I, I like to share some of these images and the meaning of those images that they had at that time and still have now. The first one that was really, of course, obvious in a way, uh, in this hundred years of change perspective are we could finally see fires. You could really see fires as they were happening. You could map fires and this gives you an impression of the size of an area covered by a Landsat uh, image. Um, one Landsat image on the left uh, side is roughly the size of two thirds of the Netherlands. Uh, on the right hand side you see the insert enlarged and you can see the intensity of the burn as well to some extent. Now, in itself, this looks quite uh, maybe uh, simple, but if you start looking at the, the information that we got at that time, and this is the image I received in 1974, uh, it becomes more interesting. Uh, here you see that uh, it is a winter image. It has three bands, four, five, and seven, which means it uses green, red, and near infrared light. But the amazing part is the, this is again, the size of roughly uh, 100 uh, nautical miles or let's say 160 uh, kilometers in a, in a square. Um, you see that the tremendous uh, difference in vegetation, um, uh, the, the complexity of the vegetation. And what you see in fact is uh, snow enhances tree density and tree cover. You see, uh, for example, uh, or you can identify, for example, uh, at least five different fire times for histories. Uh, around one, you see a fire that was very recent, uh, probably in the, la mid in the last five years. Two, a fire that happened in the last 10 to 20 years. Three, 30 to 40, four, 60 to 80, five, 90 to 100. Uh, in a sense, you can see because of the tone and the color, an age perspective of this area. In fact, what you see, uh, 100 years of fire history. Now, that seems simple to us now, but at that time it opened our eyes and essentially was saying fires are really far more important and have been far more important than we ever expected them to be in the boreal system. Uh, so this is like looking back 100 years in time. 
Now, also you can see if we have five fires or five ages in 100 years, likely this area will burn more than once every 100 years. It like burns one to twice, sometimes three times every 100 years. Many areas burn, burn repeatedly. Um, in 1990, uh, NASA launched its geocover uh, coverage, and by using certain spectral bands, it kind of enhances this fire history even better. And I love this particular cover because it gives you and allows you, in a way, to come up with a, about uh, what is it? I have here nine different uh, fire uh, ages, if you will. Uh, and in itself, it is a beautiful uh, image. It is like a piece of modern art, and. Uh, what you see here is so the most recent fires are red. Essentially, uh, there are no trees there. They are just highly reflective chlorophyll um, shrub vegetation that uh, uh, re-establishes it after the fire. John, now, yes. A question in the chat. Uh, Dan asks, how can you determine the age of the fire? Um, essentially, it's a matter of, to some extent, experience. If I go back to the image before, uh, around five, you see there a high, dark, dense area. This is essentially a, a black spruce uh, thermos forest, the typical kind of almost climax vegetation that you would find in this area. Uh, area three, for example, is a uh, jack pine regeneration, uh, you know, 30 to 40 years age. Uh, so I expect it to be maybe 10, 15 feet tall, quite open. So snow comes through and it reflects quite a bit. So the darker the area, the denser the stand, the older the stand, etc. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we use this as well to help us better uh, do field survey work. And if we would do a, an helicopter flight or survey here, we would try to sample sites one, two, three, four, and five to establish our hypothesis that we made while we were doing the satellite interpretation. So, um, Essentially, what this slide shows here that I have is that you can do classification from satellite quite accurately. And therefore, it is not surprising that the National Forest Information System in Canada is able to map fires uh, since 1985 to 2015 every year precisely. So now we see in this whole beautiful boreal subarctic area, uh, all the fires that happened in a roughly a third year or precise 30 year time period. And even there, it is rather amazing to see that uh, almost a third of the area at least was burned, maybe even more than a third, I would say. So this notion that the boreal burns at least once every 100 years is uh, definitely visible in this 30-year uh, time frame. The other thing that you can see is when you look at the green areas, the logging areas, and uh, I'll try to use the cursor there a bit, they almost are insignificant compared to uh, the burn areas. Uh, they're all in the south, and uh, the frequency of fires is a lot less there as well. If you look at what the source of fire is, obviously lightning is the major cause in the boreal where I'm talking about. And only when people come closer to the boreal zone, you will see an increase in human caused fires as well. So that gives you a bit of that perspective. We, of course, had an interest to link uh, fire history and uh, with ecological zoning. And uh, part of our work was to come up with ecoclimatic regions of Canada to better understand the link between ecosystems and climate. Because the other thing you have to understand uh, with a country like Canada is that there are not enough climate stations, at least not uh, 50, 60 years ago, to get a really good handle on uh, the, the link between climate and uh, forest growth or uh, ecosystem behavior. So we established those maps and uh, we also used it. I, well, I should have said also with the previous slide that there is obviously a very close correlation between the eco zones that we already uh, established and the fire patterns that we saw. We used these maps as well a bit later in 1988 to uh, model uh, the potential impact on, uh, on climate as well. And you can see in this simple model at that time, and this is one of the earlier climate models that we did uh, in my group, um, uh, that uh, in particular the boreal zone is affected, uh, highly affected by potential uh, climate change. 
Now, of course, we, we have the 100 year fire cycle as already seen. And uh, I'd like to give you a bit of a perspective of uh, what I found, how indigenous people, how the Indians in a way live and look at uh, fires. Fires for them are essentially a normal part of the ecosystem, as you can see in this image. Uh, this is uh, uh, from a PhD thesis that um, uh, used the uh, information from elders in a forest community in Manitoba to describe how they look at uh, the fire pattern. Well, for me, it was really fascinating to see this after so many years, that in a 100-year fire cycle, one of the first things they noticed is that blueberries, of course, come in after the fire. Great, after blueberries, you get more popular in jack pine. Moose come back, come in because there is more popular there, so there is good moose hunting. Uh, the good trapping arrives as well. But jack pine, after a while, becomes too tall and uh, for hares to feed on their lower branches, so they, they decline. Trapping, therefore, at least diminishes. But later on, owls appear in burned snags. Uh, the next phase, popular, popular declines, moose decline, which is a major food source for uh, uh, native people. After that, vegetation get taller and larger, ground lichen appears, caribou and so on. But the amazing thing, of course, as well, is that really when you look at old forest areas, uh, where we think of a climax forest, that, uh, well, over mature forest, I would say, these are not great places but, um, for, um, for surviving uh, in uh, in a native or indigenous situation. So it is maybe not surprising that perhaps even in the past they may have um, aided fires to develop in some areas. I, I tend to work a lot from satellite. It doesn't mean that I um, should totally neglect you to give you an impression of what some of these major ecosystems look like. Um, the left hand one, the left hand corner, shows you a typical black spruce uh, feather moss stand. Black spruce is the Pizzea mariana and um, uh, you know, common uh, throughout the whole area and the whole the boreal zone. Um, the, the, the top bottom, um, the, the, the bottom one, the bottom image shows northern open black spruce like the forest. There you can see that the black spruce in the, after the fire is being replaced by jack pine, uh, Pinus banksiana. Uh, but as an open system as well, not very dense. The right bottom, uh, a typical regeneration after a fire of uh, softwoods, uh, in this case, uh, white birch and uh, poplar, but white birch most prominent. And the top area, the top corner on the above is uh, for me interesting in a sense, because it is a wetland, it is a bog, where you have typically only black spruce, but even after a fire, uh, suddenly you see uh, uh, a regeneration of jack pine in uh, a quite dense form. You also can imagine, of course, that if you have a snow cover in these areas, that, the, for example, the top uh, corner there would be essentially uh, quite light in tone. Uh, snow would really come through it uh, quite well, so it would not be that hard to establish this as a, a fire that is probably in the 10 to 20 year range. Um, uh, my observations after this fire history a bit is um, fires are, nat are a natural part of the ecosystem in Canada. Boreal forest, bo forest may burn several times in 100 years. Um, fires were most abundant after glaciation during, during the Holocene thermal maximum. They were about two times the present uh, frequency of fires. They de decreased during the neoglacial period. Uh, the last 3,000 years, uh, probably, you know, although I have no information about that, during the medieval warm, they probably were higher as well. Uh, uh, the question, of course, is uh, under climate warming scenarios that we typically see, we expect a doubling of uh, fire frequency. And in some cases, we can learn there from the past, from the areas that we already have investigated with two or three times uh, the fire frequency of normal. Uh, and um, so, but this is the section that deals primarily with fires, and uh, you know the next question here is what about permafrost and increasing wildland fires? I will, you know, move there into the, the permafrost discussion. So, if there are any more questions, there's always a good opportunity to uh, to ask them as well. 
perhaps I, sh I should make another point. Uh, one of the reasons I'm really talking to you here is uh, uh, Dan van der Linden had that uh, um, in, that I have had contacts with for a number of years, and that uh, also suggested that this perhaps could be an opportunity for uh, uh, Larix to be involved in. You have a beautiful audience, more than 50, I think. Great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, permafrost distribution, I think this is one of the things that uh, was close to my heart. And again, you, you have these things in life. Uh, it was the first year I was in Canada that I entered or got into touch with permafrost. I never had expected that, of course. But before I get into that uh, perspective and picture, I, I'd like to give you a bit of what satellite allows you to do at the moment. And not only me, but you can do the same thing. It is a, a, a public tool um, in a sense. and. Uh, Google Earth in 2004 uh, did not create those satellite images, but it made the tool available to the public and it changed in many ways uh, uh, my life as well. What it allows you to do is you can scale from global to local and back in real time almost. So I can look at the circumpolar uh, map of soils from a frost. I can superimpose a from a frost map on Google Earth. I can link it to um, peatland sensitivity to climate warming. I put that on Google Earth again, and then I can do my studies with Google Earth in detail in, uh, to check those lines. Are they correct? Should they be changed? And this, this process of going up and down the system, not only uh, in the country that you work, but it is really a system that is in real time almost, and it is in real time everywhere. It is as easy for me to go to Russia and do this stuff and look at peat uh, landforms as it is in Canada, although I may have a bit less information. That is the exciting part of the tools that also you have at your um, at your possession uh, anywhere if you want to. Now, uh, my, my interest is not the typical permafrost that most Dutch people think about, it is not the relic permafrost of the former ice ages. It is really the permafrost that deals with wetlands. It is the permafrost that was formed in the last three, four uh, thousand years. It is a permafrost that can be looked at as a climately significant permafrost because it was formed after the retreat of the glacier and after the retreat of glacial lakes. So it is not more than a couple of thousand years old. The other image that I like to show is wetlands. Well, wetlands in the bottom corner are a, a real significant part of the boreal and the subarctic ecosystem. So if you work in wetlands, you work really across all the systems in a way. The area that I show you most of the images from is that red line. It is a, a, a red line, of course, where uh, in, in a way these climate lines from um, south boreal to arctic are uh, compressed and therefore you can see a lot of change in a short distance. Um, at the same time, there are great air photos available because of early development in that area in the 1920s. Another perspective that I'd like to give you is uh, this perspective of the Wisconsin ice retreating and the formation of Glacial Lake Agassiz. Now, uh, Glacial Lake Agassiz is this area here and it, I don't know where I should have marked it actually, but maybe my pointer is visible. But you can see this water area that really extends later on far wider across this white ice cap. But you see the edge of the lake and there's also the edge of a moraine that I tend to work with quite a bit. It is like a stew wall in the Netherlands. And in a way, uh, uh, the, the landscape that you see here as well, the, the green is the boreal of the present and the purple is the shrub tundra of the present. So it gives you an idea about the climate situation at the time. Uh, I come back to this kind of uh, initially, for me, amazing image. Uh, it is a satellite image and uh, the bottom square shows the area where I started to do my research. At that time, it was we, we never thought that permafrost could occur that close to a lake, that close to um, uh, Winnipeg, that close to the south. We were really surprised and, and actually quite pleased that we could do those studies. Um, before we had satellite, uh, we had to do these photo mosaics, air photos we kind of uh, put together. And this is uh, a, a 
a part that I did. Actually, I did this for a project at the University of Manitoba. And uh, it, it gives you an idea what uh, uh, an air photo would look like. Um, a detail of that area is shown here. And uh, on the right hand side is a color infrared photo, if you see it by now. And that, of course, is a nice way of looking at uh, uh, the melting permafrost, where you have dead trees standing or almost disappearing in, uh, in the water. And you see uh, the kind of pinkish, reddish, uh, healthy uh, black spruce, Pizzea mariana. Uh, the wetlands are Larix uh, uh, wetlands with a lot of uh, little kind of uh, areas where you have rings of trees where permafrost used to be. Uh, on the left hand side, you see this frequency of these dark areas. And so in a way there, you can see on the left hand image that permafrost is far more abundant than uh, maybe you ever expect, or at least certainly than we ever expected there. So my first encounter with permafrost in 67 uh, in, in was flying with a helicopter over those wetlands. Uh, seeing a, a little area with kind of tall black spruce and we wondering, of course, why the hell would it be there? Would it be a bedrock there? Would it be soil? And starting to realize that all those trees were leaning into the, the wetland, were melting, which was melting, so that was permafrost in the bottom right hand side. Um, um, to go a bit back or to go back in history as well, because much of the work that you do or that I did is, is to some extent personal. But the first, first peak plateau in 1967 that we actually visited and landed was in the, in the, in the winter with uh, my good friends Steve Zolta and Charles Stanica. And I would not normally have perhaps mentioned that, but it is a rather interesting story because after the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, the whole faculty of forestry from Sopron University um, escaped from Hungary and moved to Canada with their profs and their students, about 200 students. They went to uh, the UBC, were kind of uh, uh, adopted there, and the profs continued to teach. So uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful story. And two of those guys, uh, I consider as my, uh, my mentors and uh, my teachers in many ways. And here we are looking at a, a, a peat plateau in the middle of the winter. I also show this because this is exactly the location where uh, we essentially made uh, this kind of cross section of what a peak plateau, a permafrost island really means. Um, you see a, a core of frozen peat, uh, sometimes frozen clay if it is deep enough. You can see with a red arrow an active layer and uh, the frozen peat and the frozen gray clay has essentially lifted up the peat layer um, and into an island. So the interesting part, of course, is that as well, peat was formed just like in the Netherlands in a matter of a couple of thousand years after glaciation. Peat is roughly maybe two meters thick here, so it is quite a time. Permafrost could only develop after the peat was formed. So permafrost cannot be much older in this area than about two and a half thousand uh, years before, uh, before present. Um, of course, here you can also ask the question, is it still there? And in the bottom uh, left corner, you see an image of the area from 1967 on top. 2010, there is still some left. Um, forest land capability on permafrost. You know, 1967, uh, we did not expect permafrost so far south. Uh, we are trying to establish the ecologically significant site regions. Uh, uh, Jean? The, yes. There's another question uh, from yeah. Dan. Uh, it's about the previous uh, slide. Uh, the yeah. question is, is this a pingo? No. Um, and a, a pingo is a far lar larger ice segment. But I find the question very interesting because it, I had originally the intent to include pingos in this discussion as well. Uh, mainly because in Holland you have so much of these pingo ruins, ruins, and uh, I find them rather large, or um, I wouldn't say large, but um, there are so many of them. And although we should have pingos in Canada, we don't have as many as we had apparently in Holland. Um, so I often think actually that some of these uh, peak plateaus could have been interpreted in, in Holland as um, pingo ruins. 
ruins. Could you maybe um, uh, say what, what a pingo is exactly? Um, well, a pingo is essentially a, um, yeah, um, a, an ice, a, a volcano of ice. You know, you have a couple of uh, layers uh, underground and water is pushed up through those layers, like in a spring, and start freezing. So it, it creates a, a mountain of ice on top of uh, um, a soil. And therefore, you can actually see a, a mountainous type of thing that is quite high. Uh, so the ones I talk about, peat plateaus here, they are about uh, maybe a meter, two meters high uh, above uh, um, the surrounding fan areas. Uh, so pingos are, have far more ice than uh, this here, in a way. They're fascinating, actually, but and uh, yeah, as I said, pingo ruins are uh, ruins are echt uh, uh, yeah, mooi plek in Nederland. Um, so anyway, we we had to deal with the notion of what do we do with the forests that grow on permafrost? Can we log that or not? Uh, obviously, uh, we would not recommend it, but uh, you never know, of course, uh, what would happen to it. But this is a, um, a peat plateau uh, island, quite large, and uh, with again Pizza and Mariano on permafrost. You can see that it was burnt in 1930, and there are also some of the peat plateaus that were not burned. Uh, the Larix fan is quite obvious, non, non frozen as well. But I'd like to land there with you for a minute. You see that the, the tree on the left is quite, uh, the tree cover is quite nice and dense. You see them sinking into the a collapsed car slowly, but not that much. Uh, typically, what you have when you do field work, you have to use a helicopter. But with a helicopter, you can usually not land anywhere except for wetlands and uh, lakes. So typically, helicopters are on uh, pontoons, floats. Uh, um, if you land, uh, you know, you can see on the perma permanently frozen uh, ground cover after the fire, uh, sphagnum moss is coming in again. It's beautiful, of course. You get a, a, a notion of the profile, again, with high frequency of those uh, sphagnum mosses that were an important part of uh, building the insulating layer to form the permafrost. The fire itself shows you a, a regeneration of uh, uh, black spruce, uh, you know, with some um, uh, rhododendron um, grunlandicum or uh, as ground cover and so on, the, the typical type of uh, situation that you find on those peat plateaus. Um, not bad, very many big, not many big trees for uh, for a 30 year burn. Um, another area I like to to show you a bit uh, from um, is uh, the top top left and slide put it in perspective. Uh, we landed there with a boat and we walked to a, a stand of trees that you can see uh, where, you know, close to the red arrow. It is forested again and uh, it gives you a bit better perception of what the situation looked like on the ground. In 1967 we make that, that walk, uh, of course with hip waders because there is no other way to get anywhere as you can see. Um, and uh, you can see the collapse I think, area in the bottom uh, right image. Three has permafrost, two is recently melted, and one uh, already you, know, you get sphagnum mosses coming in that would start building up again. And you see it is not easy to walk in the top hand uh, image over those wet areas. Uh, the only place that you can walk is on trees that have been melted, have been sunken away underground, and if you don't watch out you can get in there to the middle because the peat is roughly uh, a meter and a half uh, to some extent and uh, sometimes two meters deep. It was fun though to uh, to do this. Um, because of this I started writing in 1974 publishing on the distribution and thawing of permafrost in Manitoba and it turned out to be actually one of the first papers that uh, was dealing with permafrost melting uh, in the world. Um, and uh, essentially what I found at the time between 1946 and 1967 was that large peat plateaus melt in the center core, uh, small peat plateaus less than 50 meters melted in 20 years. Edge melting typically was between zero meters for stable edges to one meter per year for melting edges. 
Uh, Jean? Melody. Yes. We have another question from yours. Sure. I think it's about the previous slide or the one before. Yeah. And uh, the question is how come the spruce is growing on the permafrost uh, while the larix is clearly not? What advantages has the spruce over the larix, uh, larix uh, that is uh, that it is able to grow on yeah. the permafrost? Yeah. I, I think it's a, a great question because larix would grow on the permafrost as well, but it doesn't. Co it cannot compete with uh, with black spruce uh, and the. Um, black spruce does not like the uh, well. I shouldn't say it doesn't like it. It can um, it, it survives in a, in a more higher uh, lower pH system. The the bog or the uh, the black spruce bogs typically are pH 4.5, 4.6, 4.7. The fen areas in which you find the uh, the large are uh, slightly richer and uh, higher pH. But the main thing is that larix doesn't come, they don't survive in, in competition. They would love to grow in the higher areas, but they don't survive. Well, I wouldn't say they love to grow there, but uh, it, it's a, a typical separation for, uh, for the ecosystem that I work in, at least. Uh, also, yeah. it is more uh, adaptive, uh, adaptable to the fluctuating water levels that you have in fans because uh, they are really wet, as you can uh, imagine. Yeah, thank you for the answer. Uh, one short thing, uh, Jean, could yeah. you maybe uh, slow down a little bit when talking? It's oh, I feel okay. like it's quite fast uh, information. Yeah. yeah, I was afraid of that anyway, so I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll try to do that. Um, so point four is that melting started to dominate building of permafrost around 1850, uh, the end of the Little Ice Age. Uh, the age of the permafrost in this area, according to my paper at that time, was about 600 before present. Now I would think that it probably uh, is a bit older as well in many of the areas. But by 2020, I had projected that all of the permafrost would be melted. So we are now in 2020. 2021, so we can say, well, we can try to find out and see what actually has happened. In the one that we just visited, the slide, you can see that uh, if we go on the walking tour again, uh, all the permafrost was, had disappeared in 2011, both on the left-hand side as well as on the, the right-hand side, where we have um, just uh, surface water left and very little areas of permafrost. So in that sense, the prediction is reasonably accurate. Um, I won't go into too much detail about this, but essentially this reflects the different type of uh, melting things that you would see in permafrost islands, permafrost wetlands. Small ones would uh, disappear, uh, you know, like around B number two, you would get a circular melt around a, uh, a permafrost body. The larger ones, you get central melting, central collapse scars. In our eyes, that was quite often related to the aging of the forest stands uh, on the permafrost. When they started to disintegrating, they started also to disintegrate the sphagnum layers and the protective layers and so on. On the real large peak plateaus, uh, you can see that uh, melting uh, has essentially uh, eliminated all permafrost already and only around four uh, you see some permafrost left and five are the collapse areas but it is a melting from the inside. Well if we look at the same area in 2007 uh, we see for example that uh, the B image the area has totally disappeared. For the C uh, image, there is some left, maybe about um, 20%. Uh, the D image on the right hand side, uh, all permafrost has gone. So essentially, uh, the prediction was not too bad, but actually, there is still more permafrost than I had expected. And to explore that a bit, uh, I also look at air photos. Uh, 
uh, and because air folders are a really important baseline for environmental studies. Uh, even in the Netherlands, I would think that if you go to the real old ones for particular landscapes, you can find something really exciting. And uh, in Canada, in the area I worked with, I was quite particularly blessed, I would say, almost with the availability of 1920, 1930 photographs made by these, uh, what we call the flying canoes, these, these uh, old World War II, um, uh, World War I uh, double-decker planes. This is, for example, uh, one of those areas, and initially it looks perhaps quite um, uh, useless as an image. It is not a very high resolution image, not that detailed. But look at the arrows, the, the white arrows show you black spruce stands on permafrost. You also see a peat plateau that was burnt around 1900. And uh, um, uh, actually it is, a, that is my estimate by the way. So uh, looking at the vegetation that is there and uh, knowing the ecosystems in the area. And now I, in a way, superimposed a 2007 Google Earth image on the same area. And this is not a particularly great resolution image. It is a rather poor resolution image, but it is the best I got. And still, Google is, is not always the greatest in higher resolution images. But you can clearly see that the burnt peat plateaus, or the not burnt peat plateaus, I, I should say, have melted the white arrows. Uh, the burnt peat plateau seems to be more resilient than the plateaus that were uh, not burned. And th this comes back to my earlier story about the importance of fires. If we look at it in a bit more detail over time, then you see that uh, on a 1947 air photo, um, the peat plateau P looks quite uh, healthy. 1967, still not too bad. 2006, melted quite a bit, 2011 on Apple Maps, higher resolution, you can clearly see that there is not much left of it. If we look at the, the bottom corner of the first image, uh, the 1947 air photo, the, you know, with the five there, P5, uh, you can see the burn area. Uh, you can see even some of the trees that were still left after the burn. And when we move then back to the right one, we see that we see it's still a, a fairly healthy peat plateau. Uh, the edges have melted, obviously, but the rest, the center core, is in better shape than the one that was not burned. So you get here an impression that fires don't necessarily accelerate melting. Uh, I have another example of that, the same peat plateau we had looked before with the very dense uh, and forest cover. Um, and I move now to the, the next one, the satellite image. Uh, you have to use your imagination a bit, but you can see that this green blob of uh, land after the 1930 fire, still in uh, 2016, looks quite healthy. Uh, there is melting around the edges, where you see obviously some of the dark water, but it is not as much as you see here around the non-burnt peak plateaus. Uh, Jean, I have a yes. short question. Uh, maybe you mentioned it, but I missed it. Um, why is it that um, the burning slows down the melting of the permafrost or the, uh, the peat? We, we, we don't, well, we don't actually actually know uh, it. Uh, I think some of the theories that uh, that we have is that when a forest land gets too old, uh, it starts disintegrating and it tends to start disintegrating sometimes the center of those uh, course of peat plateaus, uh, breaking up the, the sphagnum mosses, uh, increasing the active layer and so on. And uh, because basically the, the stand of a forest is, is quite heavy when it is at maturity for uh, essentially a big ice lands that is, uh, let's say, one and a half meters thick. Uh, and so that's part of the issue we think uh, that uh, uh, Regenerating forest uh, creates ultimately after maybe 50, 60 years, a slightly better environment to be uh, to survive for a longer period of time. Uh, at the same time, we think that if you have a repeated fire, um, 
melting will accelerate and uh, it may ultimately collapse. So if we would have three fires in a period of, um, let's say 30, 40, 50 years, uh, I think the permafrost would not survive that. But it, it always has been a very difficult uh, notion. It is also for many um, people not that easy to understand that we can have building of permafrost and melting of permafrost happening at the same time in various environments. And the biggest difference between this area, let's say, and the uh, North Boreal or the Subarctic is that um, the process of building here is nil. Well, in this Arctic, uh, I should say, in the in the North Boreal or the South Arctic, building still in, exists while melting takes place as well. And that was my intent to start looking a bit at. Uh, and in this slide, you see areas that have been melted. Some areas show melting before 1968. Uh, it is a bit like looking back a hundred years, because you can see uh, one, two, and three. Melting sites. Three still has permafrost. Um, one is is recent melt. That is, uh, uh, you know, in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Two is an area that probably melted before uh, 1900. Uh, and uh, so, it, it it is one way of of looking at what uh, melting and how long it has been uh, in place. So, again, in this area, melting started after the. Um, um, uh, the, uh, the the ice uh, little ice age around 1850. Um, we can also reconstruct the past uh, by using images and in particular using relic scars. On the left hand image, you see these beautiful kind of lines, uh, thin lines of essentially black spruce that have stayed in place after the ice uh, melted and collapsed. And these signify quite easily uh, the maximum extent of permafrost at one time. Uh, so if we look at uh, the image for the same area around 1925, it gives you a certain way to start saying, OK, let's explore what it would be around 1850. And that's what I've tried to do on the image to the right. Uh, nothing breathtaking, but uh, uh, you, you get an idea about the maximum extent of permafrost, which is also for us interesting to know. Uh, Jean? Yeah? There's a, it's about the question asked before about uh, the melting of permafrost with relation to forest fires. Yeah. Uh, Noortje asks, uh, is it possible that the vegetation functions like a blanket to speed up the melting? Uh, the burning of the fire would then eliminate that layer, uh, just like you have weak ice when it's covered with snow. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Uh, fires destroy uh, uh, the layer in many ways. And uh, typically what we find is that after a fire, the active layer increases. But after, let's say, 30, 40, 50 years again, uh, sphagnum fuscum mosses have come in and they rebuild a, a layer, a protective layer again. And that seems to be the reason why if you have only one fire after a period of uh, 40, 50, 60 years, you're in a better shape than before. But typically, it, it is uh, all a matter of how much frost penetrates uh, the layer under the trees or on, on, under the peat, and vegetation is the key to that. Uh, uh, vegetation during the summer, uh, when you have summer heat, or in, in winter, uh, we often speculate, the less thick the snow cover is, the more frost can penetrate and the ice lands can form. So typically, what we see is that uh, uh, Frost lenses start developing under uh, spruces uh, when you have a, um, you know, a thinner snow cover. Uh, and um, yeah, it, it's really, a, a, well, from an ecological point of view, and a, a really fun thing to, to look at and to, uh, to study. And, but the other thing you have to really look at is not just at uh, uh, over a period of 10, 20 years, because many of the studies that are done on this topic really deal primarily with uh, a shorter time frame, and very few really look at uh, at a longer time frame. The only ones at a longer time frame have to do are look at the paleoecological type of approaches to get an idea. Uh. And there's also uh, another question from yeah. Dan. 
he says, uh, we had news from the huge fires in Siberia last year. Is it of another scale than your story? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say that, but typically I would say uh, no. Um, the, the kind of scales of fires that we have in Canada are huge as well. And, uh, uh, you know, no, I, I formally I cannot say an answer, but I, I think that I would expect that there the, the fires are behaving somewhat similar to ours. You, you may have special situations that, uh, that have links to drought and that kind of stuff. But uh, even in Canada, we can identify probably uh, the two areas that I showed you here are probably the areas that have the densest fire history in Canada as well. But uh, no, I, sorry, I, I, uh, I expect it would be similar. Um, for example, when I, I, I did some interviews and some work with uh, the Japanese television about beavers as well as the, uh, the BBC, and they wanted to uh, film the beavers around Wood Buffalo National Park, the longest beaver dam that I found there. And both uh, television crews couldn't operate uh, in two different time periods because of the fires. They had created so much uh, smog and fog there that Park Canada would not allow people to, uh, to go there to film. So uh, you, you get these huge fires up north in Canada as well. Of course, you know, Canada must be better than uh, Russia anyway. I'll come back to that later. Um, the other form that we do with permafrost is trying to do some time travel by using uh, latitude, by shifting from the South Boreal to the subarctic. And at the bottom portion, you see the slide of partially melted peat plateaus near Lake Winnipeg. And, uh, you know, when I move up north, um, you can see the peat plateaus as they would have been if melting would not have taken uh, place seriously. So you, you can compare the situations and uh, you can see then, OK, uh, uh, you can better, better visualize the landscape in the south as well. So in the last picture, we compared uh, point one with point two. And uh, you can see that point one and point two are quite different even when you look at mean annual temperature trends. Uh, in one, there is uh, reasonable warming. In, in two, there is reasonable warming. In two, it is quite limited in a sense. But even in the peak plateaus near Churchill, you can see some small signs of melting, but most of it is quite stable. This is typically a, a black spruce, open lichen forest again moving into uh, peak polygons and uh, so on a real arctic environment uh, there is no frost in the in between uh, sedge areas a, a typical example of a melting hole uh, you can see this is a, a telephoto picture from a helicopter uh, you can easily see the trees again sinking even there even close to the arctic into a little uh, melting hole This one I look at in a bit more detail. It is a 1970 image, also field work, and uh, it shows you a melting area. And one of the things I like always very much is to compare these areas and try to figure out the same position on Google Earth. So I try to reconstruct the melting shot or the, the photo I took with uh, from the helicopter with the Google Earth image. And it is quite amazing that you can almost put it in the same position. It's more for myself. If we compare that same landform that we saw there before in 1930, 1970, 2013, uh, you can see that the outside has not changed that much, but the little melting part at the center has increased in size. But also you see on the winter image on the right hand side that some of the areas Black spruce has grown closed. In fact, there is a kind of coagulation going on far from peat bodies into a larger shape. And this is typically a part of peatland formation as well. So here we see areas where actually permafrost has formed in a period of time of, uh, what is it, 80 years.
we're getting to the last part of the permafrost section, so it may be uh, also uh, good to uh, have a break after this one. Uh, melting and degrading permafrost. This is a similar image or a similar story than the one before. It is a 2015 Apple Maps image. So you can get it on your Apple phone, you can get it on any computer. And the right hand side is a Bing satellite image, 2016. In the middle, a 1930 aerial photo. And an aerial photo, of course, is the, the most exciting one because you have a record from that date. And when you compare it with the two, it's, it's in my mind really amazing. The Bing satellite image resolution is in the order of half a meter, uh, as well as Apple as well. Now, when you use Bing or Apple, you, of course, don't get Apple and Bing images. They are usually from, uh, you know, satellite providers that uh, sell the images to those uh, organizations. But what I found in many of Northern Canada, Apple and Bing provide far better resolution images. I don't know why they do that, but it is great to have than um, um, Google Earth does. On the red arrows on the right hand side, you can clearly see melting areas, even near Churchill in this uh, rather cold area. And again, on the in the blue areas show where some um, aggradation, some building of permafrost has taken place as well. But overall, even in this area, I would expect that uh, building is not outperforming uh, melting. My message to you here is in a way that, uh, yes, anyone can do uh, studies of permafrost melting. This is a big image again of an area in northern uh, Canada. And when you look at the resolution, when you look at this beautiful melting scar in green in this kind of purplish environment, it is not just art, it is just pure uh, uh, look at a, a virtual uh, perspective of an ecosystem. As uh, observation at the end of the permafrost story, uh, melting is slower than expected. Uh, there was more permafrost left than I predicted in 1974. Uh, I've, I've waited for a tipping moment since launch of Google Earth in the area I studied, but it didn't come. Uh, it exactly continued as was before. Um, there is more melting in mature stands that we discussed before, as mentioned as well. And uh, fire may increase the active layer, but appears to slow down melting. Repeated fires, though, will have the reverse effect and likely will, of course, accelerate the melting. Uh, this is the transition slide to uh, uh, the next part on, on beavers. So, um, it, it is interesting to look at the periods that I talked about, the recent Holocene fur trade and beavers and uh, if you get a bit of so yeah um is it a good moment to have a little break here it's uh yeah is this the, new this is the one that is I, still uh no yeah, let's have a break here because this is the introduction to the the next one anyway yeah okay yeah um uh i think there's still some a uh, little moment here to ask some questions maybe about the permafrost um uh there's i already already see a question from destin he asks, what do you mean by a tipping moment? Well, we all had expected that with uh, the climate warming taking place, that I would see a really sudden collapse of all the permafrost disappearing there. And uh, since the 2004 launch of Google Earth, I've been looking at it for every year and I couldn't find it. Um, and so I, I, that was one of the reasons I came to the conclusion that essentially the sphagnum layer of the permafrost is too strong an insulator to create this um, rapid response to climate warming. It, it provides a protective layer and therefore um, melting is very gradual and because the melting rates between 1940 and 1980 and 1980 and 2020 are virtually the same in the area that I study and that is the most southern portion of permafrost in Canada. Uh, the permafrost shouldn't be there. It's still there. That is the, the thing. And um, so I'm still waiting for it's all suddenly to uh, to disappear. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, there's another question from uh, Jorik. He asks, are the colors from the Bing map the same as if we would look it up right now? Or did you modify them to make the melting? No, 
visible. I, I usually don't modify. No, they are um, they are as they are, and you know it is. Uh, if you go to the location, uh, one of the things is that uh, they never are exactly the same. They always change them somewhat. It depends on the time of the year. It depends on the situation, and each of the system, each of the uh, the providers, Google, Apple, or NASA, or uh, or Bing. Uh, so this is the the one I see, and when I see that. I, I get so excited because it is a, then a fairly big portion of the satellite coverage that, that shows you this. Uh, and because this enhances this melting, it allows you to teach yourself what to look for. And then when you get images that are a bit poor, lower quality and, and different, you still can export that and, and, and use it. Uh, but this, this is just, you know, it, it's, uh, it's amazing. Thank you. Uh, I also had a question myself. Yeah, because uh, uh, you use uh, the images of snow covering, uh, yeah. like a, like an indicator to um, what uh, vegetation is like, right? Yeah. Um, but how do you account for differences in, say, year to year um, snow cover differences? Well, um, I don't even have that luxury to uh, to do that because I, uh, I I I just take snow cover as it appears on some of the satellite uh, coverage from Apple, from Google, or from Bing. Uh, they usually use snow cover only when they don't have good, uh, let's say, green images available, the ones that people normally recognize. Uh, so these are all uh, areas of luck, and I I take a lot of screenshots when I see that stuff to to preserve it. Um, so year from year, it is hard to uh, to use. If you would be in a, in a research institution, of course you could do this uh, uh, with some money. You can buy the images from uh, Digital Globe, and you can do a, a beautiful study uh, about uh, about the use of snow cover because snow cover in in the in an certainly in boreal ecosystem perspective is really a very uh, effective tool. Uh, but what you often see as well is that in the science community, uh, they don't always use these tools to uh, come up with a, uh, a perspective like this. OK, thank you. Um, I think this is a good moment uh, to have a little break. Um, we will be back at 17 past eight to 13 over eight. Um, if there are in the, in the meantime, people think of any questions, just type them in the chat and we'll uh, start after the break with uh, answering those questions. Um, so we will be right back. Okay. So did you did you make yourself a coffee, uh, Jean? Uh, no, not yet. No. <laughs> what what time is it in in Canada right now? Uh, it is op the ogenblik uh, twee uur, tien over twee. Oh, Oké, okay. ja, mooi. <laughs> het is zo knap dat dit kan, hè? Ik vind het zo geweldig. It is. Ja. It is. It is echt geweldig. Ja. 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 En uh, nee, en ik ik vind het nog steeds uh, leuk dat je daarvoor gezorgd hebt, want. Uh, ja. Laar X heeft ook dit gedaan. Ja, Laar X. Ja. Ja. Well, maar kijk, zonder jou was ik nooit bij Laar X terecht gekomen. Oh ja, nou goed, dan uh, neem ik dat uh, graag aan. Maar joh, wat heb jij toch veel meegemaakt? Ongelooflijk, wat een leven. <laughs> wat leuk, ja. En, en, ja, ben, en... Jij, ben jij ongerust over klimaatverandering? Uh, nou, ik geloof niet dat we, ja, ik zou zeggen niet ongerust, ik geloof dat het hoofdzakelijk een kwestie is van uh, adaptation. Ik, ik geloof niet dat we er veel aan kunnen doen eigenlijk, uh, ja. eerlijk gezegd. En um, ja, uh, wat dat betreft vind ik, 
de, mens, de mensheid niet echt een bepaald goed voorbeeld op het ogenblik om te denken dat zij de goede oplossingen kunnen vinden. Nee, nee. Als je naar de politieke situaties kijkt, zoals ja, de Verenigde Staten bijvoorbeeld in de laatste vier jaar, is toch eigenlijk uh, onbegrijpelijk. En dat is ook een onderdeel van onze wereld ook nog. Dus. Ja, ja. Maar ik heb altijd dus een van de dingen uh, die ik wel belangrijk heb gevonden, is uh, uh, voor mij eigenlijk. Uh, Business models are so important. Changing business models in the, the context of uh, climate change adaptation, because the, the easiest way to liberate money is by changing business models. It is not by government. And uh, um, speciaal toen ik dus in, a, in, a, in het poolgebied werkte met uh, the IUC and as an Arctic chair, uh, dan realiseer je dat uh, uh, belastinggeld is niet genoeg om uh, sustainable projecten te creëren in, uh, in dat gebied. Uh, je moet echt uh, uh, de, de, de business models veranderen van uh, you know, um, mining companies, uh, oil and gas companies en dat soort dingen. Ja. Uh, die zijn in staat om biljoenen geld te creëren uh, 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 als het erop aankomt. Ja. Ik, ik was al de, uh, met de, de, de tijd van Kyoto. Uh, uh, de, de enige industrie in Canada die zich uh, um, die Kyoto de, de guidelines haalde, was de bosbouwindustrie. Oké, okay, ja. Yeah. Uh, en alleen maar omdat ze dus biljoenen geïnvesteerd hadden in, uh, om hun energy footprint uh, kleiner te maken. Ja. Oh, yeah. En dat deed ze in een kwestie van vijf, zes, zeven, acht jaar. Uh, en alleen maar om hun markt te beschermen. Dus is voor mij dat. Is Canada een, een netto exporteur van energie? Uh, ik zou het niet weten eerlijk gezegd. Uh, ik denk het wel, ja. ja. We, we hebben dus een aantal dingen die er niet in ons voordeel werken. En onder andere is dat uh, eigenlijk, uh, bijvoorbeeld als je kijkt naar uh, aluminiumproductie. Uh, wij uh, creëren aluminium uh, oor. Ja. En dat gaat ten grote kosten van onze energieconsumptie. Ja. Ja, we hebben goedkope uh, waterenergie uh, en die worden gebruikt voor dat soort dingen. Ja. Dus, dat is, uh, uh, dus in dat zin, onze energy footprint is uh, quite large. Ja, ja joh, jeetje. Ja. Het, het gekke, als ik bedenk hoeveel nieuws ik over Canada krijg, dan is dat best bescheiden. Maar er wordt wel veel over die, die oliecompanies. Uh, en, en de, uh, heb je ook Teerzanden? Was dat ook niet een van ja, jullie? Ja, ja, precies. Ja. Ja, ja, ja. Ja. En, en, en ja, de toekomst daar ziet, niet erg, ziet er niet erg rooskleurig uit. Maar als er hoge you know, oil en gas prijzen zijn, dan, ja. Zie, ja, dan, dan stopt dat ja. weer. Maar ja, in principe, ja, uh, daar word je niet blij van natuurlijk. Ja. Van die operaties. Maar ja, mining, oil en gas is still de, de grote kwestie is: uh, well, can, you, can you change uh, organisaties zoals Shell? Nou, Shell already has withdrawn from the oil sands, okay. the tar sands. Ja. Ja, maar kunnen zij dus uh, als in een ontwikkeling, kunnen ze een gedeelte van hun business plan reserveren voor uh, sustainability? Ja. Because uh, well, in Canada zijn de, het zijn de bosbouwcompanies die eigenlijk uh, de de facto managers zijn van het landschap. Het is niet door de, de overheden. Oké. Okay. Ja, you, and, and the, yeah. Zijn dat buitenlandse organisaties of zijn dat binnenlandse? Dat kan. Dat kan. Ja. Dat kan heel goed, want in de tegenwoordige wereld worden die allemaal ge, gekocht en verkocht. So, ja. uh, je hebt dus wel regulations, maar in, in feite is het de lokale operatie. Ja. Uh, die daarvoor zorgt. En dus als je dat business model iets zou kunnen veranderen, en dat is de site gedeeld, als je dat van een, een hout logging operatie kan veranderen in een soort ecos ecosystem management operatie, Mooi. Ja. dat is de hele idee. Dan, society may have to pay them for ecosystem management. Ja. Uh, maar als het alleen maar uh, pulp and paper is. Ja, zeker. Ja. En voor mij dat is de biggest challenge. Can you change that business model? Wauw. Ja, interessant uh, spul. Ja, dank je. Het is een beetje als met waste management. Vroeger was dat dus gewoon de uh, garbage collection. Ja. En nu we call it waste management. Ja. Dat is een big transformation. 
Er staat een vraag, hoeveel natuur is er nog in Canada? Hoe ja, hoeveel zijn jullie kwijtgeraakt? Ja, ja. Uh, ah. uh, ik zou het verder toelichten. Hebt u trouwens liever dat ik Nederlands praat of Engels? Dat is een Oké, okay. um, ja, ik zal een beetje toelichten, want u had er bijvoorbeeld over onder andere um, bosbranden. Ja. En dat heeft natuurlijk enorme impact op de natuur. Ja. Maar nu is het natuurlijk ook wel weer zo dat na een bosbrand natuur ook weer kan herstellen. Precies. Dus, en toen vroeg ik me af hoeveel natuur is er not, dan nog. En dan bedoel ik niet door de mens, maar echt de ja. natuur. Het, 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 het beste model is eigenlijk die indigenous model die, die ik je liet zien. Mm -hmm. uh, waarin je dus ziet hoe de, meer en meer de Indianen kijken naar zo'n uh, evolutie na een brand. Uh, yeah. dus, en al die fases zijn belangrijk. En dat is een natuurlijk ecosysteem. Yeah. Uh, en zelfs als je een herhaalde brand krijgt en je krijgt geen woord uh, uh, in plaats van, uh, van Jack Pine of een Den krijg je een, uh, een populier die zich mm -hmm. voortplant door uh, uh, wortels. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, dan krijg je gewoon wat meer uh, elanden en dat soort dingen voor een tijdje. Ja, precies. En maar... heb, um, ja, ik was er wat later bij aangeschoven, aangescho maar ja. hebt u zelf in Canada gewoond? Of? Ja, ik woon er nog steeds. Ja. Oh, fantastisch. Want ik wil zelf ook uh, heel graag een keer naar Canada <laughs> vanwege de positieve ervaringen over het natuur daar. Ja. Dus uh, well, heb je aanraders? Well, het hangt ervan af wat je, wat je wilt doen en wat je, hoe je werkt. Je, wil, kijk, je hebt natuurlijk de Pars Canada als een mooie organisatie. Uh, ja. Je hebt ook de Canadian Forest. Wat, wat is je achtergrond? Nou ja, ik um, studeer net als alle anderen hier op uh, Van Halle Adelstein. En ik studeer bos- en natuurbeheer. Ja. En um, ik zou bijvoorbeeld advies uh, willen gaan geven vanuit het beheerbedrijf, uh, maar dan niet in Nederland, maar in het buitenland en misschien zelfs wel in Canada. Ja, ja. maar goed, uh, kijk, ten eerste zou ik je aanraden, uh, doe een master's anyway, voordat je iets anders zou doen. Maar als je dat niet gaat doen, dan zou ik uh, eventueel, uh, uh, well, ik zou het dan nog aanraden om het eventueel wat in een land als Canada te doen, waar je het misschien in part-time kan doen ook. Ja, precies. Uh, 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 Oké, okay. als ik even tussendoor mag. Uh, uh, misschien is het beter om dit zo even uh, na de lezing nog even uh, sure. te bespreken. Het is inmiddels 17 over. Oh, uh, oké. Okay. Ja, we, we hebben na de lezing denk ik nog wel uh, tijd voor. Oké, okay, uh, top. Maar ik zie dat er verder nog geen nieuwe vragen zijn, dus ik denk dat je weer... Uh, oké. Okay. Ja. Zijn we er nog steeds? Kunnen jullie me zien? Ik bedoel mijn presentatie. Ja, ja ik kan uh, alles dan okay. weer. Ja, ja. So we have the re recent Holocene, fur trade and beavers. Um, en uh, zoals je kan zien in dit, uh, deze image, um, uh, yeah, yeah, ik, wil, ik wil even nog laten zien wat de, de warmte tijden was in de medieval period en de Little Ice Age. En wat het meant voor een land zoals Canada, for example. Uh, you see that uh, around uh, a, a thousand uh, years uh, before present, the uh, no, yeah, a thousand years, uh, Vikings were settling at last in uh, Meadow in Newfoundland. This was a warm period. This was the time that there was big travel uh, in a way, um, and obviously uh, permafrost was shrinking at that time as well, likely. Uh, the colder Little Ice Age started around 1400, and you can see that in many of the Dutch uh, landscape paintings were skaters and that kind of stuff. But uh, in our case, the Little Ice Age, the later part of it, can be linked to fur trade, uh, not because it was any better, but it just happened at that time, uh, that the fur trade. So, uh, in fact, there was lots of ice, uh, very difficult to navigate, and uh, uh, that that's really what I wanted to give. But uh, around 1900, uh, you see that the Little Ice Age disappears a bit, and it's also the time that uh, perhaps beavers uh, started to, well, not come back yet, but I'll, I'll go to the next one first. 
beavers, beavers everywhere. And when I was looking around in 1970, 1980, I didn't see too many beavers while I was doing my field work. Beavers were almost extinct and I was surprised to see them now, but uh, I was also surprised to see that my work with beavers ultimately ended up with an Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres in 2010 and with the uh, BBC Discovery Channel Earth uh, from Space in 2018. And why are they interested? Just because I seem to have found the longest beaver dam in the world. Now, going back to this, this amazing moment when Google Earth launched in 2004, when essentially satellite images became available to anyone in the world at different resolutions, uh, I started seeing a beaver footprint from satellite. Uh, suddenly, on better resolution images, you could see dams, lodges, ponds, tree kill, flooding, meadows, channels. So my first thought was, well, can you monitor habitat expansion in the context of uh, global warming. So the first thing I started doing was exploring its northern limit. Now, uh, of course, I should re-emphasize the, the point that around 1900, uh, the beaver was a threatened species, almost extinct. Uh, the range of the beaver is quite well known and looks like a big area, but again, just imagine it was almost blank at that time. In 1930, we had Grey Owl, uh, a native of England who acted like a Métis, a half Indian, and he uh, essentially wrote a lot, a lot about conservation and initiated an important movement, the conservation movement in Canada. So you can ask, in a sense, what has happened with beaver in Canada since 1930? Now, I looked at another form of uh, way of looking at the, the landscape. I looked at the Canadian Geographical Names Database. I was responsible for the Names Database for a part of my career. And I tried to look at it and say, well, what kind of geographical names reflect the name beaver? Lakes, rivers, uh, places, uh, points, whatever. And I came up with this kind of, I think, rather interesting perspectives. It is really a historic perspective, uh, almost a, a perspective of the time in Canada of beavers before they became almost extinct, how widespread they were. And I found it interesting, but I also used it in my search for edges and uh, limits of beaver as well. Now, it can be as simple as that, but it also can be looking at, for example, like in the left-hand image, a quick exploration of the northern limit of beaver with Google Earth. In 2019, I still do that, but a lot more, I would say almost sophisticated, by looking at a great amount of detail of beeper uh, occurrence or absence, using at the same time my field work data as, uh, as field truth and ground truth. Anyway, I'm still exploring Northern Beaver, and I thought, well, let's first look at York Factory. York Factory used to be one of the most important fur trading posts in Canada, in the world, and the entry point through the Hudson Bay to the European market but also to the supply of beaver furs from the rest of, uh, of Canada. Well, at the time of the, the York factory was in operation, of course, beaver was extinct here. And I thought the first thing I do is find out whether they are still here. And you see those markers uh, along the shoreline. So let's look at um, one of them in a bit more detail. And so when the image appears, you can see uh, um, a little pond, you can see maybe a little uh, lodge, beaver lodge, you can see a meadow and so on. I think I should give you the markers because otherwise it may be a bit hard to see, but the beaver pond of course is quite clear, it is dark, the, the, the dam keeps water uh, locked from a downward flow and uh, the beaver lodge, you can see the meadow as well, that well, the meadow floods are irregular depending on the time of the year. But this is from satellite, so obviously it is very easy to identify a beaver if you have those characteristics from satellite. Um, upstream from that, uh, the same image, you have this, these peak plateaus permanently frozen again with black spruce open lichen forest, a bit like we saw in the, in the south, and these tamarack uh, sedge communities in the wetlands that are non-frozen. This happened to be a, a fall image, 
So the tamarack already, or the larynx, larynx is already coloring and gives some beautiful images. The red arrows show a series of beaver dams, quite small, and there are even one or two or three lodges visible too. For me, the, in this question, of course, the, the question can also be, have beavers uh, an impact on the melting of permafrost? But I'm not going to answer them in this situation. I continue to explore a bit beavers, uh, the northern boreal dams, lodges and ponds. And typically, when you move to a landscape with less forest, obviously dams will be less visible as well. But here, the red arrows indicate those dams quite easily. And even the beaver lodges, which are typically not more than eight meters, eight to 10 meters in size, are visible on this image. By the way, this image was burned uh, over as well, uh, but obviously beaver have been able to survive in this uh, situation. Another area at the edge of their um, limit uh, is this here. The red arrows show these beautiful uh, beaver lodges, and you see a series of dams that hold water back from the flow up, uh, up north, uh, literally up north as well. The area is hardly treed, it is almost close to the tree line, and most of it are polygonal uh, peak plateaus. That means you get uh, polygonal patterns in the, in the peat with a lot of lichen uh, on it. Now, when I was doing the work as well, I, I was reading in Wikipedia that the longest beaver dam in the world, the largest one, was in Three Forks, Montana. 652 meters, 4.3 meters high, and I, I couldn't find that dam, and there are very seldomly things that I cannot find on a satellite image, so I thought if I cannot find it, perhaps I can at least perhaps find a dam in Canada that must be longer than that dam. Obviously, it is the Castor Canadensis, and the Castor Canadensis would expect to be built the largest dams in Canada, isn't it? Um, as a guide to find the longest dam, I use the vertebrate routes in the image on the left, and uh, because it gives you a link to the historic information of where the beaver pelts came from, where you had the rich, rich harvest and so on. And on the right side, I used Lake Agassiz, the glacial, the big glacial lake that uh, formed after the Wisconsin Ice Age retreated. It gives me a link into the wetlands, and uh, it is an area that I happen to have a very strong interest in. Um, you can visualize these glacial lakes in a way, uh, and here you see this lake in Manitoba. The red arrow is the permafrost study area that I talked about in my second part of the presentation. And the Pasquia Hills is on the blue area, and I come there a bit later, but you see these plateaus, like the Rounding Mountains, Duck Mountains, and Porcupine Mountains, which form an important part of the landscape and uh, guide me in my search. When you look at the relief map of Canada, you can see those dark rinding and uh, mountains and porcupine mountains, uh, um, as well as the Pasquia Hills there with a the red arrow. And I'm going to look in the red arrow area a bit in more detail. Um, this is a NASA geocover image, and it may not look that pleasant, but it is for me exciting because it kind of uses two infrared bands. Uh, and translate these into um, slightly different color. It enhances, let's say, small wetlands, small wetland bodies. You see, for example, the water bodies are really black or really intense blue. And uh, it also shows the um, vegetation of poplar on the slopes of the porcupine um, upland. It's very green, but the pizzea, the black spruce, is very dark uh, on the central plateau there. Beach lines of Glacial Lake Agassiz are also visible. These are these little stripes and lines. And, and of course, this is the kind of fascinating, for me, fascinating picture that you get when you uh, uh, know that the lake has been there and you look for the limits of it. Now, in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to this area here, the red area. And I will show uh, you, uh, give you an idea about the real resolution of the images. Here we see in the NASA geocover a whole bunch of small little ponds. And of course, what could it be? And yes, they are beaver dams and they are beaver ponds. Well, this is quite a concentration, you would think, because this is a fairly sizable area in size. Now, let's look at the red triangle there. You see quite a few of them. And 
if there are beaver ponds, and in 1945, this image shows clearly that there was nothing there. So between, let's say, 2090 in this case and 45, um, you know, 45 years, uh, suddenly something must have drast something drastically must have happened. And yes, it turns out to be a beaver, a beaver area. In fact, it's the highest beaver uh, density of beavers I ever have seen, not just in Canada, but uh, in the world as well. And uh, it may not look that impressive, but you can see the individual lodges again behind the dams and the, and the ponds and all that kind of stuff. But it, it, uh, even today, it still amazes me. Uh, a slightly different scale and a different image. It was taken probably around 2018 in the same area. And now you see uh, the scale as well. It is quite sizable. Uh, you see the, the Shore Lake 20, 28A is an Indian reserve, or it's also called Pakwa Lake. But you can look at this as there are about uh, 600, 500, 600 uh, population living there. On the right-hand side of the road, there probably live about uh, seven, 800 beavers. So there are more beavers living there than, uh, uh, than people. The same area, but now just a, a fall image. And you show that the, uh, I should have mentioned the sediment load that you see in a different correlation of the, 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 the scene is, is a bit, uh, is, is reduced now. I started studying this area in a bit more detail, not by going there, I, I should have done that, but I just used uh, uh, Google Earth further and I started looking at an elevation profile and uh, uh, I just mapped the, the line on Google Earth and it gives you then a, a pretty nice uh, cross section of, the, of, of the, the sloping area. And you can observe that um, uh, there are many beaver dams uh, that are um, in the steep sloping area. Uh, then the downslope streams, they are short, they're relatively high. They have a high water flow. They collapse easily during spring runoff, runoff. And they collapse easily because they also tend to rot quite easily after 10, after 20 years or so, they tend to not last too long. Uh, in fact, all dam dams become dangerous and I'll show you an example of that. Um, if you start looking at the prime beaver habitat that I identified earlier, you see that the slope is about one to one and a half percent. There are long dams and they are stable. This is a, an example again of the slope itself, where you see uh, in the upper left hand corner all these light toned areas where beaver dams have busted and the sediment load has been taken down into the dams uh, further downstream. And uh, it, it's still a uh, an amazing area, an amazing transformation of, a, of an ecosystem. Uh, of course, you can often wonder, uh, why do I look at satellite? Well, if you drive along this area, you see here um, a photograph of uh, the area, you see a big beaver lodge, but you would not expect that this would be the highest density of beaver in Canada. Uh, you only, in a way, can find it out through satellite or maybe a drone if you happen to fly it there. If we go back to that, then the longest beaver dam landscapes in summary are slightly sloping bottom lands, perhaps over alluvial fans. They are wetlands with no physiographic limitation to dam length. And they don't like uh, excessive spring runoff to break dams. So back to my relief map of Canada. Given that as a given, given could you then say that this would be Canada's beaver belt? Well, satellite allows you to explore that. Another thing I found out was that there was a, an indigenous group, an Indian uh, band that was called the Danet San, the beaver tribe. Uh, the name was based on the fact that the, those who are living with beaver uh, are there. So you would expect there to have a fairly good, uh, uh, maybe frequency of beaver habitat. Well, and this was also one of the exciting moments. The Im image that you see is, is a bit hard to interpret for most of you, but in the real sense, it had a bit higher resolution. And here I started realizing for the first time that you would get really beaver landscapes, not just you know beaver communities or uh, other 
small streams with beaver or longer streams. But here you have a landscape, a big chunk of land, about 170, uh, 170 hundred kilometers square, 70 kilometers long, maybe about uh, 15 kilometers wide in some places, where every stream is controlled by beavers. To give you an idea, in this yellow uh, part, you can see uh, in a bit more detail a satellite image again. Well, the drainage is to the uh, to the left top in a way, and you see all those beaver dams. It is just amazing. There is no water moving in this area without beaver controlling it. It's it's just fabricasting that you can have these large areas that are so uh, managed by these beaver engineers. Another example, uh, again quite old because it uses an old uh, Google Earth image, but the message is the same using the. Uh, the geocover image, you can see the beaver ponds, and when you look at the detailed satellite image, you can see the individual ponds as well. So the proof finding it is not that hard. Now, how to get to the longest beaver dam? So I really try to fly around with uh, Google Earth in particular and other satellite systems around these different plateaus and uh, move from the, obviously the highest density of beavers to the largest beaver landscape. And yes, I ran into the longest beaver dam. And as perhaps promised uh, by science, uh, you can see that the longest beaver dam uh, areas occur in the alluvial fans of these plateau like landscapes. Now, where is the longest beaver dam? I'll turn the satellite image around a bit. And you, know, you can see this innocuous area, not that clear. But this, this would be a dam, it looks quite long. Only by looking at satellite and air, photograph, air photographs, I will be, of course, determining that it's a real situation. This is the 2007 Google Earth image, which I put in a community post for the first time identifying this as a, a unique situation. Uh, it didn't go anywhere at the time, and I didn't try to uh, market it at all, but it shows you a clear ID of the, the Beaver Dam which is not very high, but very long, about 835 meters, I say there, but later on I made it 850. You can see the drainage direction of the water, and you can see an old beaver lodge and a new one uh, quite clearly uh, surrounded by wetlands. Again, in 1980, this didn't exist. And um, you know, just projecting the dam on it, you can clearly see that uh, there may be a few ponds that are there, but no real activity of beaver. Uh, but look at the PO area that is a popular uh, stand that has disappeared uh, ultimately quite effectively as well uh, when the beaver arrived. These are kind of the first kind of the picture of videos in 2008. Um, I don't have a video of it, but the, the pictures are based on that. You can clearly see the dam, the pond area, if you see with uh, sedges and so on. You can see the, the lodge in the center and so on another perspective. In itself, I mean, this is okay. It was kind of fun to do. Uh, on the left bottom corner, you see a, a, a new dam being built. So perhaps there is a connection between the two, but uh, in itself, it was kind of fun. Uh, it, it became viral in 2008 and 2010, not because of myself, but because of the media. And it ended up with, yes, uh, BBC, Alan, and all that kind of stuff. Japan was also very interested in it as well. And uh, later on, uh, BBC, the Discovery Channel, uh, interviewed me and used the images for uh, their uh, session on Earth from space. Now, not all the um, things that you see from beavers are very beneficial. Uh, and you can sometimes look at the other side of beaver as well. And some of these things are quite, uh, quite amazing. In 2009, there was a train derailment near Mattawa, Ontario, along the Ottawa River. Uh, you see uh, in this mosaic that I prepared of some of the, the, the damage. Uh, the derailment included two locomotives and six rail cars. Um, they say that about three successive dams collapsed and that uh, uh, a water um, uh, flood was released of almost 3.7 meters high over the tracks, which were washed away. So quite amazing. Even more amazing is that 
in 2013 and 2014, this happened again. So now I met the, the BFMs in a bit more detail to see what actually has happened. And yes, the BFMs around one, two, three, and four. One near four really collapsed, pushing down the third, the second, and the first one, and creating a flood of, flood of water that on the 2015 image shows another break of the, the railway track. Perhaps it's not surprising that uh, Canadian Pacific abandoned the railway because they found it to be easier to ship all their goods through Toronto to Ottawa than use this uh, regional uh, railway track. Now, Jean, this is, I have a yes? short, short question yeah. from uh, Dan. Uh, the, do beavers eat both conifer and broadleaf trees? Um, it, it depends. They have their preferences and they love to have, uh, for example, uh, poplar and birch uh, trees in particular. But if they are hungry, they eat anything really. And when you, for example, get into the Arctic, uh, they, they even to survive, they uh, may go and eat um, just um, um, aquatic vegetation as well. But they have a strong preference for uh, um, hardwoods, well, soft hardwoods, I would say. But they, they tackle a, a spruce sometimes, or, uh, or uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah. And in these areas in the south that I'm showing now, this is all, uh, they look for the favorite trees. But in, in some areas that I lived uh, on, in rocky areas, beavers even have a, a form of, um, how do you call that? Um, I forgot the term. Um, Agriculture. I, oh, anyway, doesn't matter. Let's say if if uh, they have chewed away enough of the trees, they move to a different area, and uh, five years later they come back when there is regrowth. So it is just like a, a cropping kind of system that they use. Um, anyway, um, I'm at um, the time of 138. Typically, uh, I, this could be a time I can break off the presentation and and kind of go to the summary, uh, unless. Uh, you still want to hear something about uh, the beavers in the, the Russian Republic of Karelia and uh, Tierra del Fuego. Yes. Fira, it's up to you to do to decide. Okay. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, we have uh, we have some time for that. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's also a, a question in between. Yeah. Uh, from York, he asks, uh, has their preference? This is about the uh, beaver preference. Anything to do with the pitch that pine trees produce? It could well be. Uh, I, I think that they don't necessarily, of course, I mean, when you look at the bark of a poplar, uh, it, it really looks like uh, even a willow or even alder, it looks like quite juicy and moist and so on. So uh, it is uh, no doubt. And uh, the chewiness of the bark, they only would do when they really um, need, it, need it for building a dam, perhaps uh, not so much. Because in a way, the first thing they also eat are the branches. And so they, they take down a poplar, they chew down all the branches, um, and then only later on they may start a bit with the trunk. So, um, so the branches are the, the prime target. But I, I, I'm not a beaver uh, ecologist, uh, an expert uh, in that sense at all. But uh, okay, this is the perspective, so I'll continue a bit, but um, also in the day, in the, the time of 2008, the first time it became uh, uh, kind of visible, uh, the, the longest dam, I started looking at uh, uh, a newspaper article and I saw one in McLean's Canada that talked about uh, Canadian beavers are chomping their way across Russia. And I thought, for two reasons, I thought, well, I have to see whether the longest dam is really in Canada, so I should look also whether uh, how long the dams are in, in Russia and how long the dams are um, in Tierra del Fuego, which of course comes uh, uh, frequently in the news as well. So, uh, castor fiber in Europe versus castor canadensis in Eurasia, uh, or I should both in Eurasia, this gives you the distribution. Uh, castor canadensis, of course, was introduced after uh, the Second World War in Finland first, and then in, uh, in Russia. And I'm starting to have a look at it. Uh, I, I did a fairly extensive survey of uh, beavers in this area in 2009. I found it very hard actually in Finland to find any signs, 
but Karelia was, was, was quite promising and uh, I did a fair bit of work there. So yes, when we look at beavers there, the typical things are they, tree, they kill trees, but you also realize their job is to kill trees and therefore they should be commended on that. Now, they say that uh, the castor fiber um, doesn't create as many dams and doesn't kill as many trees, so maybe that is their, their, uh, their issue. But uh, anyway, you, you get uh, some beautiful examples of tree kill in the Karelia there. Um, the longest beaver dam in Karelia, possibly in Europe, is 230 meters. Uh, I haven't seen myself a dam that is longer there, but you can see this one very quite clearly on this image on the, the left hand side. And uh, that's only lasted for uh, a few decades, as far as I remember. Uh, Jean? Yes. A, a quick question. Uh, what makes the Canadian beaver more uh, maybe aggressive or prevalent over the yeah, in beaver? It is, it, they say it is more aggressive. Uh, it is more a dam builder than the fiber, but the fiber still um, builds dams as well in the right situations. But uh, And also in the competition in Karelia, they seem to think that uh, uh, the Canadian beaver has kind of pushed uh, the fiber a bit away from uh, some of the territories that they were still uh, in. Now, also, of course, what you, you have the social media as well. In my days, when I was working there uh, around 2007, uh, Pano Ramio was my, my, my important source of finding some tr real ground truth information in Karelia. And uh, so there you can find uh, images and photographs that are uh, geographically located and that you can use in your search as a ground truth truth and uh, nowadays of course with uh, your if you're an effective user of uh, social media like uh, Bellingcat you can do a lot more with that stuff as well. This is a, an area in Karelia which is a bit more impressive uh, a bit what you would like expect in Canada as a as a normal situation of a, a series of 13, 14, 50 dams in sequence in a stream uh, controlling its flow very nicely and um, this one is, uh, is similar, a bit more detailed, but you can see that even there they have the tendency to try to control every stream they get an opportunity to control. Uh, Jean, there's another question from uh, yeah. Jürgen. He asks, are there uh, Castor fever and Castor canadensis hybrids? Um, I don't, I don't think that they have been doing that too much. Uh, for, for, I, I, I couldn't give a good answer, no. I don't think so. Well, the last uh, part, the last section, just a few slides left to give you a synoptic view of uh, um, Tierra del Fuego. And this, this story is, is quite interesting as well. You see here uh, my uh, uh, Google Earth markers in blue, red, green, uh, blue, yellow, etc., showing the various decades of uh, um, Castor Canadensis expansion across the landscape. Uh, I got interested in this, of course, with the idea of finding are there longer dams there, are there more impressive beaver landscapes in Tierra del Fuego. Uh, but I entered it through the, the website of Thomas Lamb, uh, where they talked about the release of the beaver of Tierra del Fuego. Well, Tom Lamb is a, a trapper and a trader uh, and an aviation a pilot from, uh, from Canada in the Saskatchewan Delta in Manitoba and he operated Lamb Air and he was asked by the dictator at the time after the World War in Argentine, Argentina to, uh, to import about uh, 45, uh, 46 Canadian uh, beaver to Tierra del Fuego to try to build a, uh, uh, a trapping industry. And he did that and this is the image that you see here where he releases the beaver in, uh, in the lake um, at a particular location. Like you can do with Google Earth, you can really triangulate yourself. You can triangulate the picture and find the exact location um, by, by tilting and shifting it, just like you can fly in, in Google Earth as well uh, in, a, in an airplane. So that's what I did here. And with that approach, I could exactly locate the place where they, uh, the yellow marker where they released these, the, the beaver at that time. And 50 years later, because that was 1940. 
seven, so it has been more than 50 years, and now 70 years later, you see uh, beavers are still active there with the, uh, the purple arrows. Uh, beaver landscapes in Tierra del Fuego are quite amazing as well. Uh, you see these beautiful red colored or orange colored landscapes of uh, sphagnum mosses that are also floating and, and quite impressive. And then in between you see in the stream bed and on the side of the, uh, the forested areas, quite large and frequent beaver dams and lodges. So uh, you, you can come up with, with really quite amazing and impressive uh, beaver landscapes there. Um, going up north in the areas where they are more recent in existence, you see there also uh, uh, on the top uh, a beaver stream controlled by quite a few dams. Uh, the middle uh, image is a, a detailed uh, close-up of the dams and the bottom one shows uh, an area that was burned over. And it is interesting in the burned over just area to see what beavers will be doing there in the next decade or so. Well, uh, if you wonder where the, the beavers of Tierra del Fuego came from, it was Moose Lake. Uh, Moose Lake, the home of the Tom, La, Thomas Lamb trading post. Um, and uh, I mapped the locations of the areas where he trapped the beaver, Devil's Portage and Caroline Lake, the ancestral home of the Tierra del Fuego beavers. At least that's what you think. but. Uh, in hindsight, the beavers in the Saskatchewan River Delta in Manitoba came from New York. So, too bad. The Canadian beaver ultimately came from the US anyway. But, so. Uh, Jean, well, there's a, yes. another question. Uh, the introduction of the beavers, uh, was yeah. it uh, only for uh, fur trapping purposes? Yes. Okay. It was for, for for trapping purposes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. And of course, there were no uh, natural enemies there, like the wolf for beaver. So they expanded like crazy, and uh, even they uh, they swam across the ocean to uh, uh, enter the mainland of South America. So they are really considered a big pest. They are uh, an invasive species, and they would like to really get rid of them. But I think it will be very difficult to do that. Is the swimming also the um, way that the, the Canadian beaver uh, expanded into Russia? Uh, they were released in a lake or close to a lake. Well, well, yeah, no, typically they expand or they go through, through streams and they don't easily cover big lake or big uh, sea areas, apparently. So in a way, we are really surprised, uh, or I should say the specialists are really surprised that they crossed uh, some of those uh, let's say, sea uh, landscapes. Uh, um, and uh, so they're pretty tough. Uh, but, you know, I have also seen beaver in desert situation that I thought, my God, you know, how, how can they do that? How do they adapt to these extreme different conditions? So this is the end of my uh, presentation, essentially. Uh, after 13 years, it is still the longest dam in the world, uh, to my surprise, because I put it there as a tongue-in-cheek type of thing. Uh, the amazing thing of the beavers is their expansion of population within their range. It is almost so much more impressive than you would, what you would expect in uh, in the change to climate in the, towards the north. It is hard to map the northern limit from satellite because at the north edge, you don't have dams anymore and no ponds per se. So you cannot easily see from satellite where they will be. So you have to use more sophisticated ways. Suddenly, they are still one of the most important ecosystem change agents other than mankind, where you see them operate like in Canada. It, I only showed you a few of the landscapes, but you almost can say that any landscape that is natural in Canada, Canada nowadays is for a, to a great extent managed by its beaver population. And as the last slide, uh, uh, my work continues. I'm trying to map the, the top 100 beaver landscapes in Canada at some time. You know, have to do something in your spare time uh, during your corona period. Thanks for your uh, interest. Yes, sorry for the time you. it took. Sorry for the long time. Oh, no problem. It's perfect. Uh, it's perfect timing. Um, thank you, first off, for your 
uh, absolute interesting uh, presentation. We have a little bit of time to answer some more questions. If there's people that, uh, that still have some questions, you can raise your hand um, by pressing the button and then I'll give the people that have a question, I give them a turn. Um, so maybe, yeah. Yeah, I have a question um, about this Danit Sat tribe. You were talking about that they were living amongst the beavers or with the beavers. But since they are such important ecosystem uh, engineers, basically, um, do you know how they lived together with the beavers? Because I can imagine that they must be very nomadic or living high. Um, and no. Um, they were not uh, that nomadic. Uh, I guess they lived essentially where the, the food was. And uh, in that in their case, I guess they were kind of confined in this beaver area, which was not that large. And uh, but it was it they were not the how do you say the healthiest or the wealthiest um, group uh, and not the strongest. In fact, they were pushed out of their territory by uh, the Chippewaian and the Cree. Um, you know, you get those situations, uh, they are the fur traders, they have um, guns, and uh, so the, uh, the, the Danetza uh, were pushed more to the, the direction of British Columbia, for example, so uh, they are a bit outside the territory. But they, it was a hard life, because when you look at uh, their situation there, a lot of wetlands, uh, it was more, more uh, yeah, a real surviving situation. Oh, thank you for your answer. Um, we have another question from Destin. Uh, his question is, do you think beavers have had a great influence on permafrost formation? Uh, I know it wasn't part of the presentation, but I wonder what you think. I think for me, it's a very interesting question because that is what I'm looking uh, at. Um, I'm looking at the moment at beavers are invading some of those areas where uh, permafrost has disappeared. Now, these are not the well, richest areas anyway, so it is not a great rapid development that you can, but it is clear that if they um, fluctuate water levels in streams, that it can have an impact on, on increased melting, for example. Uh, but I don't have, I have examples, but nothing really dramatic uh, where it takes place. But, uh, uh, again, the, the main thing with beaver is they go anywhere where you don't expect them to go. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I also uh, thought of another question, which is, uh, regards the permafrost. Uh, you're probably aware of the Pleistocene Park that uh, is, is around for quite a while now in Siberia, where they are trying to mitigate the permafrost melting by um, putting large herbivores on the landscape um, to keep the landscape open from vegetation. Yeah, I'm not aware of that per se, uh, but uh, it sounds like an interesting uh, thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but when you talk about uh, uh, large herbivores, you like to talk about uh, reindeer? Uh, yes, they have uh, reindeer, they have moose, and they have also yeah. uh, yaks and uh, wild yeah. horses and uh, bison. And yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, I mean, let's say in Canada, we would not easily look at that because the only you, we only would like to probably work with natural species, which would be caribou. And they have been in, in decline in many ways. Uh, uh, I, I've been involved in, in in landscape ecological mapping to to try to preserve the porcupine uh, caribou herd as well, and uh, but uh, I I I think uh, no I, I I I'm yeah maybe it is a good way for them to adapt that way I I think uh, I, I could not see that stuff happening in Canada because we don't really have any uh, use of those territories that way. Yeah, uh, it's it's also still a very much in a testing, a testing yeah. environment, like uh, seeing what the effects are at the moment. And I, I'm in a way so much used to uh, uh, the, the natural landscape in Canada. Uh, so I, I uh, the when you look at the Russian solution, it almost looks a bit more like uh, managing a cultural landscape rather than a natural ecosystem. 
Yeah, they're, they're trying to, um, how do you say, um, like make it uh, kind of like the Pleistocene ecosystem with like this same amount of uh, herbivore grazing. Okay, the last yeah, time. sure. So, yeah, that sounds interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, are there any other questions from uh, anyone here? I think, I don't think so, because I don't see any raised hands or any questions in the chats. Um, yeah, you get uh, the greetings from uh, the Groet van Daan. He says, uh, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. And he will write you an email tomorrow because um, he, uh, he has business to attend. OK. Um, and I think that's a, a good good moment to uh, close off here. It's uh, ex exactly nine o'clock. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very much interesting. I think I speak for uh, everyone here. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, the yeah, I think that's ook wel weer een Nederlands kant trouwens. Ja, yeah, tuurlijk, ja. Yeah. Ja, de opname die komt op YouTube te staan, dus uh, hou dat in de gaten. Oké. Okay. Uh, oh, Destin die vraagt nog uh, uh, of er een mogelijkheid is om uh, jou te volgen, Jan, op de sociale media. Nou, nee, ik, 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 ik zit niet op sociale media, nee. Ik, uh, <laughs> ik heb een website, dat is al. En dat is... Een uh, website? Ja, het is www.geostrategist.com. Oké. Ik zal het uh, oh, in de chat zetten. Ik denk also Jorik, raise his hand. Uh, Jorik, if you want to turn on your microphone, you can. Uh. All right, thank you, Carmen. Uh, I was about to ask about the same that Destin asked. Is there any way to <laughs> somehow stay in contact or get to know a little bit more or even in in the future uh, see if there's a possible way to uh, to add to the research that you're doing because it's it's really interesting to me and I'd like to be more involved if that's possible by any chance. Uh, sure, you know, uh, you can contact me. Uh... And uh, all I like you to, to do is, is I like to stimulate you to use some of those uh, amazing satellite tools that uh, anybody can use. Even in, in Holland, you could use them in the Netherlands or in Europe uh, across ecosystems. That sounds amazing. Is there is it possible to contact contract? Wow. <laughs> Is it possible to contact you through through email email or something? Sure, or is yeah. it also yeah. through the website? No, well, email um, is a website email. Yeah, my my email address is uh, known to Gerard, so there's no problem there. That's amazing. Thank you. My, yeah. my company is uh, ecoinformatics.com. Okay, that's it. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you can. Uh, we kunnen straks nog even contact houden, dan kan ik wel de gegevens ja. geven. Fantastisch, ja. dat is heel uh, erg fijn. Even zien, ik heb nog een, oh ja, Nienke die heeft de website ook in de chat gegooid, hartstikke bedankt. Leuk, uh, Nienke, Tobi. Um, ja, Jan, nogmaals hartstikke bedankt. Um, iedereen bedankt voor het uh, komen. Uh, nou, ik zou zeggen, uh, hou onze sociale media in de gaten voor de komende lezingen. Ik zal even kort toelichten welke er aankomen. We hebben... Op 2 maart, uh, dus volgende week, hebben wij uh, een lezing over bosbranden. Uh, deze wordt gegeven door uh, Rosa Diemond. Het gaat over bosbranden in. Zeg ik dat goed? Uh, oh, ja, in Afrika. Ik ben even land kwijt welk land het is. Uh, we hebben de week daarop Wouter Del Forterie uh, met klimaat- en bosbeheer. Uh, dankjewel, Joost. De bosbranden in Ghana gaat het over. Uh, en 23 maart hebben wij een lezing over bodemecologie. Um, uh, even denken, ja, dat waren in ieder geval de komende lezingen. Uh, maar houd onze Facebook in de gaten, onze Instagram, website, uh, daar wordt allemaal op gepost. Uh, nou, en dan wens ik jullie allemaal nog een hele fijne avond. En uh, ja, Shanti, hartstikke bedankt. En uh, ik denk dat we wel in contact met elkaar kunnen blijven. Bedankt. Uh, ja. Ik heb ervan genoten. Ik heb, ik heb het gewaardeerd. Super. Dankjewel, Destin.
Ja, als je ook in de chat kijkt, iedereen is uh, 